One of the first questions that we have to ask is why bother studying organizational culture? Why does it matter? Well, it's a complex concept that ultimately affects everything about an organization, from its reputation all the way through how well the organization performs. A rhetorical scholar called Kenneth Burke argued that humans build their cultures nervously and loquaciously on the edge of an abyss. Well, what do you mean by this? Well, culture is always tentative because it's always changing. It's loquacious because we live in culture. That is, everything that we say and do is going to be connected to a cultural identity, whether we're conscious of it or not. And finally, I know it seems dramatic, but teetering on the edge of an abyss, and, and that sounds darker than it really is, but it represents the uncertainty that exists all around us, and that culture itself is what helps us manage that uncertainty. It would be really easy to stay philosophical about culture because there's a lot to talk about. But when we're talking about it in an organizational context, I think it's also useful to be very practical. So when we start to answer this question, why study organizational culture? There are several reasons from a pragmatic perspective that we should do it. First, it helps us to cope with uncertainty. Like I alluded to in the setup for this, Everything around us is swirly, is uncertain, is, is awkward. What culture helps us do, one of the important functions that it does, is to guide us to appropriately expressing our beliefs, our values, and our norms. When we think about norms, we can think about something that is, what's the standard? How do we get things done? And within an organizational context, this helps everyone to be moving forward to a much more specific set of goals. And this is where organizational culture can differ from a broader discussion of culture. So when we're talking about norms, we can talk about them in terms of certainly what's forced, what what we have to do within an organizational context, and also what we want to do in that organizational context. So within any organization, we're going to have a set of expectations. The large portion of this set of expectations is how sh we should conduct ourselves within the organization and how the organization can move forward with all the uncertainty and all the different potential paths around it, move forward together. The second reason that we study organizational culture is that not only does it help us cope with the uncertainty through offering norms, expectations, and really a way of moving forward together, but in doing so, that helps us manage the chaos. That could be the chaos of people interacting with different sets of expectations, or simply the, the sheer weight of having to cope with the external world. So in a very, very tangible way, Culture gives us a way to separate ourselves from everything outside the organization and then focus on a plan to move forward and to cooperate, collaborate, and achieve very specific organizational goals. If culture helps us to cope with uncertainty and to manage chaos, then we should also be very specific in defining what we mean by organizational culture. Trice and Beyer, uh, two of the founding authors in the study of organizational culture, define culture as a social system arising from a network of shared ideologies consisting of two components, the substance or the networks of meaning associated with ideologies, norms, and values, and the forms or the practices where the meanings are expressed, affirmed, and communicated to and by the members. As Trice and Bayer defined an organizational culture, they saw it as having two distinctive components. So let's discuss each of those in more detail and offer some concrete examples. The first component was the substance of an organization's culture, which they also referred to as an organization's ideology. They argued the ideology reflects the organization's shared system of beliefs, values, and norms. Organizations often try and talk directly about their own organizational cultures, so you can find these references in their mission and vision statements, or even like their strategic vision documents. An example of how this is articulated is from Southwest Airlines in the US. 
Part of that company's vision statement focuses on the types of employees they want. For example, Southwest wants employees who are dedicated, mission-oriented, close-knit, and high-spirited. This reflects on the ideology because Southwest sees themselves as being a positive place to work and a place that centers on values like collaboration, fun, hard working. So they try to articulate those qualities in their recruitment materials and certainly on their website and any other official documentation. Trace and Byer acknowledged that an organization's ideology is awfully fuzzy. It's not something we can directly see, and this made it really hard to connect to research and to practice. So for them, the question became, how is culture articulated every single day in any organization? They argued that it's through the second component, the forms of organizational culture, which they define as the observable ways that members of a culture express their cultural ideas. Now, in the next lecture, we'll go into a lot more detail about this. But if we go back to Southwest Airlines, the question would be, what does a company do to create a collaborative and positive organizational culture? There are a couple of examples that I think really show off what Southwest is about, at least from an employee's perspective. First, once a quarter, the management actually comes out of their offices to do some real work. They work as baggage handlers, ticket agents, and even attendants. The founder of the company, Herb Kelleher, believed that it was important for management to always be connected to the real work that gets done in a company. For him, there are both cultural and practical reasons to do this. On the practical side, it helps a company to understand what's working and what's not so that managers can make better decisions. However, from a cultural side, it has a lot of benefits. First and foremost, it breaks down the barriers between levels of the organization's hierarchy. Based on research done in the company, it made the employees feel valued and meaningfully connected to the company. Second, apparently it was always good for a laugh. The stories of managers working for a day were a rich source of humor and socialization within the company as it was told by their employees. So it sets this tone for positive engagement all the way up and down the chain. The second example of a ritual for Southwest is that in their, at their headquarters in Dallas, Texas, every Friday there's a barbecue and anyone who happens to be working in Dallas that day is welcome to attend. It's one of the ways that they give back to their employees and it's certainly part of a larger package of things that the company does, but it sets a nice tone. It also is quite a relaxed tone. This isn't a formal meal. This is something that's nice, it's relaxed. Dallas is pretty warm, so it's outdoors. This sets the, the illustrations of how positive, how collaborative and fun the company sees itself being. So when we take a look at an organization, if we look for the everyday, we can start to see what kind of company it is. And when we do this, we're talking about the forms of an organization's culture and the degree to which they're consistent with the ideology that the organization espouses. Before we explore the forms of organizational culture in depth, let's explore some of its characteristics. Trice and Bayer argue that there are several characteristics that all organizational cultures share. The first of which is that they're collective. They're produced through interactions and over time. So while leaders and influential individuals within organizations certainly can affect and help sh to shape an organization's culture, it's through the everyday through routine interactions, through events that happen, and, and across time that organizational cultures really form and are developed. That's why we can think of them as collective in nature. A second characteristic of organizational cultures is that they're emotionally charged. When we're the member of an organization, we will care about the culture and we'll care about it, what it means to be in it. I mean, if we take something as simple as say the teams that we're fans of, we get passionate about our sporting teams because it's something to cheer on the winning and the losing, but it's more than that. If we are properly in, in grained within that organization's culture, within the fan culture, 
we care about the players, we care about the way that it's played, the ethic of the team, all of those kinds of things. Now, if we bring that back out to other types of organizations that we're involved in, even our work organizations, we end up caring a lot about what goes on in the organization, not just because it's the work that we do, but it has implications in terms of our attachment and our identification with. So for example, employees who have a high level of identification that they feel that emotion about their organization, they'll work harder for it. So it's to an organization's advantage to create an environment that people genuinely care about their organization in. The more they care, the more that they're going to work for that organization. So there's a practical side of having the emotional charge in there, but there's also just the reality that we spend a lot of time within the organizations that we work for and are members of. So we end up coming to care about it. Maybe not so much as, as our favorite sports teams, but we end up having some attachment to them. Third, an organization's culture is historically based. So when I was talking about it being collective and also being emotionally charged, this isn't something that happens overnight, but begins with the organization's founding and is developed over time. I think one of the most interesting case studies in this is Disney. So when Walt Disney created the company, he was thinking of the happiest place on earth with Disneyland and also with creating the, the animations for kids, but it was all about the outside that people who saw the movies, who came to the parks would have this amazing experience, that it was incredibly positive, all of that. What's interesting though, is over the years, that didn't always translate into what it meant to work for the organization. And that there were periods where there's actually quite a bit of, of challenge workers rights issues within the Disney Corporation. However, if we look at the Disney Corporation today, in the United States, it was one of the first employers to offer same-sex benefits. It has been a place that is consistently well paid over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and generally speaking, in trying to create the happiest place on earth, what they have identified was that the organization inside needed to match the organization outside. So the historical basis for Disney as an organization started with the notion of, of what Walt Disney envisioned for its media, for its parks, for the visitors and the media consumers, but has ultimately contributed to a very positive work culture um, that is based in the same ethic but it certainly wasn't one that didn't have bumps along the way. So when we think of the characteristics of an organization's culture, we have to think about the evolution and that it's always changing and always in development. A fourth characteristic of organizational culture is that they are also inherently symbolic. So one of the elements of being in a culture is that, that when you identify as a member of a culture or when you're identifying with that organization, it expresses meaning. It communicates a little bit of what the organization's values are, but also how you internalize those values. So even when we're talking about how the organization portrays itself, something as simple as the organization's logos or symbolism ends up representing what that organization or how that organization sees itself. So the color emotion guide gives you a bit of an idea as to where organizations start from in terms of their branding. And none of this really is by accident. It's meant to express what the organization sees as its core value or what it represents. So then the question that becomes, how is that represented internally within the organization and how is it represented externally to all of its stakeholders, you know, its consumers, what have you. So part of the challenge in understanding, evaluating and engaging with organizational cultures is asking about that the symbolism within that organization, what does it reflect? What meaning do you get when you're a member of it? And what meaning do you get when you're watching it from the outside? As much as possible, those types of visions should match up. 
the symbols that an organization presents for itself should resonate both with the employees as well as to the external stakeholders. The fifth characteristic of an organizational culture that it's dynamic shouldn't be surprising given what we've already been talking about that it's collective, historic, emotionally charged, and symbolic. Because of all of these things, different people interacting over time, it means that co cultures are constantly going to be changing. Um, and there are several reasons that this is true. First is that communication is imperfect. Even when I'm trying to explain what it means to be in an organization, if I'm a member of that, and I'm trying to tell a newcomer, you know, what's it like being here? People, what I say may not be the way that people take it. And then people will have their lived experiences within that organization and they come to different conclusions or there might be a slightly different meaning that's put on that. Second, over time, behavioral expectations may vary. I mean, even if we think about the difference of work in 2019 versus 2020 versus 2021 and beyond, we can see that what the ways that we're expecting to interact and engage in organizations is something that can be affected by world events like pandemics, but it can also be affected by just changing operational realities independent of any major crisis going on. So as behavioral expectations change, the organization's culture is changing. But one of the reasons that it's dynamic, that it constantly changes, is that it's often taken for granted. We may all use and recognize a symbol for an organization, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we all interpret it the same way. So I may take for granted what I think the organization that I work for is about, but if someone else works in the same right alongside me day by day, week by week, they may come to a very different conclusion. And so, Part of the prevalence of symbolism is that meanings are imprecise, that there isn't a rule book for what an organizational culture is. Now, I know that a lot of organizations will try and talk about their organization's culture, like the example from Southwest Airlines. But how that's personified, applied, and then comes back out to employees to consumers, to any stakeholder, isn't necessarily guaranteed. So because it's symbolic, it means that that meaning is imprecise. And finally, one of the reasons that cultures change is that when new people come into an organization, they always bring the cultural baggage, and that can be good or bad, of their previous organizational experiences. So if you're talking about how people come in how even generations come in to work for organizations. They're going to be bringing their expectations, their interests, the, the ways that they have experienced work, or if they haven't experienced work, their ideal vision of how the work goes. So these are all bags that we carry with us from organization to organization, and that especially can have influence on how we do our work, what it means to be in the organization, how we relate to one another. So for all of these reasons, constant organizations are constantly in flux in terms of their culture and what it, what the fundamental experience we all have in them. So the final way that we can characterize organizational culture is to say that they're inherently fuzzy. That oftentimes in organizations and any culture really, that they incorporate contradictions, paradoxes, ambiguity and confusion. Because we all come into them, we bring our baggage, they're collective, they're emotional, they're historic, they're symbolic, and they're changing, people will have a different understanding of what it means to work in an organization. So you'll see this at different layers of an organization if it's very hierarchical. You'll also see it in different job functions within organizations. So the more and more that groups are left on their own to interact and to do the carry out the work that they do, you'll see distinctive subcultures or co-cultures develop. So this means that, that in one group, let's say in the management group, uh, the organization's culture may, may have a very different kind of meaning than it might in HR, communications, and sometimes they're not always compatible. 
So even within an organization, you'll find that there will be some kernel of consistency, but how they're implemented, how people's experiences are. You can't generalize to, to the whole culture without taking a look at the smaller functional groups within an organization. So when we say that they're inherently fuzzy, they're like any culture where you will have different groups with different experiences and all of that comes together to represent the organization. So in as much as there can be ambiguity and confusion, that is simply one of the characteristics of what it means to be in any culture, let alone an organization's culture. Though organizational cultures might be a little bit fuzzy and that there can be some meaning slippage, one of the advantages of developing and trying to actively maintain a strong organizational culture is that it does serve the organization's benefit, that it provides positive outcomes for an organization. So when we're talking about an organization's culture, we can talk about it in a continuum of being very strong to very weak. And so when we're talking about the stronger organizational cultures, we can take a look at the different types of outcomes from those stronger cultures. The first outcome is that they help to manage collective uncertainty. So we have, we have been in a year of uncertainty to this point, and we will continue to see uncertainty. And, and as a matter of fact, the last 10 years for most organizations have carried a lot of uncertainty, more so than you could probably find at any other point in history. So one of the important elements of an organization's culture is helping people and helping organizations to understand where they fit within the environment around them. This is a really important function because it lets people focus on the task at hand. Let me give you an example of a crisis situation, which is, which is, and brings in a whole level of uncertainty compared to routine operations. So in 2010, when the BP well exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, um, as a company, BP had to marshal its resources in order to respond and respond well. One of the challenges that the chief financial officer, Brian Gilvari, talked about when he was talking about his leadership experience was keeping his employees focused so that they could free up the money that allowed BP to respond. Now, obviously, that meant moving resources, working long hours, all of those kinds of things. So the degree to which he could reduce the uncertainty for his employees to work and to let them focus, that meant that they were more effective. That also then had the ripple effects of allowing the company to respond better to the crisis over the months that, that the explosion and the oil flow went. So in organizations, if you have a strong sense of the, the culture within that organization, it helps when they're punctuated periods of actual crisis, but also to cope with fluctuating environments, economic crashes, economic gains, all of the things that have come to be sort of the state of typical affairs within organizations. The stronger the organization's culture, the more that people have to hold on to. So managing collective uncertainty is probably the most important outcome of having a strong organizational culture. A second critical outcome of an, a strong organizational culture is that it creates social order. It lets people understand how they relate to one another and in doing their everyday work, what they can expect out of one another. Now, of course, this can become oppressive, and when it does, then that doesn't create a positive outcome. It actually can, can work against the organization. But in typical organizational settings, the social order lets people very quickly slot in to their job tasks, their job functions, know what's expected of them, and also know how they're supposed to react and respond to their colleagues, to their bosses, and so on. One of the things we have to do when we're newcomers to an organization or when we're 
young workers, so it's our first or second kind of job, is that we have to figure out what the social order is in our profession when we're young, but also as we get more experienced and change jobs to understand what the social order is within any organization. And that's something that ends up being relatively unique to the organization. Across industries, there might be commonalities, but each organization will have its own kind of a social order. And this is one of the important outcomes of an organizational culture. Strong organizational cultures do have stronger sense of social order. But again, you always balance that against too, con too much conformity and too many pressures for social conformity. A third important outcome of a strong organizational culture is that it creates continuity. My favorite analogy here is to think of a bucket of water. If you put a cup in and take some out, do you leave a hole in the middle of the bucket of water? Of course you don't. It fills in. The volume may change. Likewise, if you pour in a cup of water in, it changes the volume, but it doesn't change the bucket of water. An organization's culture functions in much the same way in creating continuity. So even though people may change, and of course we know that over time this changes the organization's culture, it gives something to hold on to. So the stronger the organization's culture, the less impact any single person coming and going might have. This lets people react and relate to one another, so it helps to support the reduction of uncertainty and maintaining social order. That's another function, is that continuity across time and certainly across changes that might happen within the organization. That's an important outcome of a strong organizational culture. A fourth important outcome of a strong organizational culture is that it creates a shared identity and commitment to the organization. So let's take a quick step back and ask what creates an identity? So identities, and, and we will carry with us many identities over time. You may carry an identity based on your religious affiliation, your national culture, your regional culture, your occupational culture. So every person has multiple identities that matter to them. And how are these formed? Well, they're informed by our choices. They're informed by our values, our beliefs, our appearance, our ethnicity, our practices and habits, our work and hobbies, our friends and family, our interests, our objects and possessions that matter to us, and our creations. So this is why we will carry with us multiple identities. Each one of these may contribute to a different aspect of our identity. So within an organizational culture, if you have a strong organizational culture, there will be especially targeting the values, the beliefs, the appearance, the interests and the creations, plus the practices and habits, all of those will very much be informed by the organization, what it means to work in the organization. So even our choices within organizations will then start to inform and start to affect how we see the organization and our relationship to it. So if you have a really positive organizational culture, you end up seeing the culture is very similar to you, that the organization personifies a lot of the values that you may have and that the way that your colleagues work, the way that even the the things you produce. So for example, if climate change is really important to you, you may want to work for an organization that is either in, an, in a green industry or is, for example, like Aldi, working to reduce its climate impact with, with the way that it works. So it's not only in how we seek out organizations, but it's also in terms of the organizations that we work in how we choose to inform the work that we do, and even how we can influence the organizations that we work in. So if we have a strong identification with our organization, it'll be that we have a lot of points of interest with our own personal identities in common with how we see the organization functioning. So that's a strong benefit because you end up with employees who are committed, to the mission and employees who are committed to the work that the organization is doing. So it's an outcome that ensures job satisfaction and ensures reduces um, employee turnover. 
The final outcome of an organization's culture can be a little bit controversial, but strong organizational cultures, like all cultures, encourage a little bit of ethnocentrism. Now, before you think in terms of some of the bad outcomes of ethnocentrism that we typically talk about, things like prejudice, discrimination, those kinds of very real outcomes of ethnocentrism, let me put it slightly differently, that ethnocentrism, generally speaking, is about a belief that the organization that you're a member of is good, and actually that it that there's something you value in that organization above and beyond other organizations like it. So it actually can be quite a healthy thing if you're in an organization that shares a lot of the identities, shares a lot of the commitments that you have. So if you have a strong organizational culture, that encourages you to view your organization as a better one. Now, that also means then that you're probably going to have, and it reinforces that identity and commitment. On the negative side, it can actually influence groupthink so that you sometimes can get blinded by the organization and the belief in the organization to the extent that you aren't critical about what the organization is doing. So ethnocentrism in and of itself does, isn't positive or negative. It's what you do with it. So in terms of an organizational setting, I think that a strong organizational culture promoting the strong identification, promoting the notion that your organization has value is in and of itself quite positive. It's just that we have to be vigilant and, and guard against the negative elements. So that would be the prejudice, it would be the, the bandwagon effect, so the lack of critical reflection about the organization and its place. But in and of itself, it is just something, it is an outcome of the organization's culture. So when we look at this portion of the lecture, We've defined the substance as being both the ideology and the forms. And then we've looked at the characteristics of an organization's culture as well as its outcomes. So from the conceptual side, hopefully this starts to give you an idea about the importance of an organization's culture. In the next podcast, we focus on the forms. So the how do we see it, touch it, taste it, feel it kinds of elements.